you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on out, Pastor Kate. Praise God. Good to see you this morning. Hallelujah. God, great things happening. This afternoon into early this evening, we have the MEC uh, Network Celebration. We are joining our network uh, and church with uh, two other ministries in Clifton, New Jersey at uh, Grace City Church. And uh, they're right about 10 minutes from here. If you have not registered yet, you can. You can go to our events page or go to your app. Just click events. Click on the event. And what this, is event, what this event is about is uh, we and the other ministries are working to pursue the way of Christ and his apostles. What were the traditions of the early church? What were the principles from scripture? And tonight we're going to be gathering together to literally celebrate the love feast or a communion around an entire meal. There's going to be over 100 people there tonight, and we're today, today, tonight, and uh, we're going to be opening up with the bread and, and celebrating an entire meal, dining with each other and with Christ. Amen. And then we're going to be closing. Our elder Irwin is going to be closing on uh, speaking about the blood. But after that, we're going to be getting into discussing the importance of the gathering and the centrality of the meal to the first century church. Because we're all working together, and these gentlemen that you're going to meet tonight, I'm actually studying with, um, they've become uh, pretty close friends now, and uh, we're working in our region. And so we want to meet people from other churches and other traditions and other denominations who are pursuing the principles of Jesus. Amen? So again, anybody can come to it. It is a potluck. And because there's that many people, we need everybody to at least bring a dish, right? If you're coming, bring a dish. I mean, Pastor Kate's cooking tonight, so today, so, you know, I'm going to be there, so, for her food, so, um, yeah, listen, uh, we encourage you to do that, no, no charge to come, but just make sure you bring something, uh, wouldn't it be terrible if 100 people showed up with nothing, that's not going to happen, don't worry, we're going to have, we're going to have a lot of food, so, uh, come, think about that, for those who are registered, there's an article attached to the registration, there's a button, you click that, you read that, um, if you have time, if not, no worries, uh, because we're going to be breaking up into groups and be having conversation about some of the ideas. Uh, so looking forward to that tonight. It starts at 2.45 today. It starts at 2.45. We'll really be beginning at 3, um, but we're going to be opening up the meal. So try to be there at 2.45 because we're going to open the meal at 3. All right? Very exciting, right? We should be in unity with other ministries, right? Amen. We, I, I want us to bump into people at ShopRite, in the movies, from people from other church. We're like, hey, Harry, hey, Sally, you know, because we're one people. We're, we're one church. Uh, and so I think that's awesome. Amen? All right, now tonight, not today, but tonight is what's happening. Youth. Is it Sorry. 13 to 18, um, make sure you go on the app for the secret location. It's always a blessed time. So come on out for that. Also, this... Saturday, ladies, is our women's meeting, 10 a.m. Yep. in the back. So come on out for that, too. And we want to let you know about um, this coming Friday. I'll be ministering um, in a leadership conference that's closed to the leaders um, in Roselle, New Jersey. But Friday evening uh, in Roselle, um, which is, what, about 30 minutes, 35, 30, 35 minutes from here, um, there's an open worship night. So if you're interested in going to that, that's open to the public. And uh, that's from 7 to 9 p.m. So um, if you're interested in that, just send an email to contact at IWantGrace.org. Contact at IWantGrace.org. We'll give you the information to be able to, to get to that. Lastly, one conference two weeks mm -hmm. away. So if you haven't registered, Coming up. make sure you register because yep. time is running out. So the one conference is about intercession. And some people have asked when I was ministering. Some people are making hotel reservations and things. I'll be ministering Friday evening and Saturday morning. And uh, we're looking forward, forward to a very powerful conference. This is a partnership with the New England Prayer Center. Um, it's being hosted by a pretty large church. So we're expecting a great turnout. And uh, Jason Upton, for those who may know him, will be leading worship on Sunday evening. And uh, going to be very powerful. I, 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 I've never met Jason before, uh, but I know that uh, I've loved his intimacy with God and uh, his worship. So we're going to be there being blessed and brought in um, by the ministry of Jason Upton Sunday evening. So, yeah. And lastly, oh, lastly, save the date for May oh, 19th. Yeah, this is great. 
Uh, we are having a special guest for our marriage ministry, so married couples, engaged couples. Yeah. Um, David Tyree, who was uh, on the Giants team, him yeah. and his wife will be ministering at Ooh. our marriage. Anybody ministry. know D David Tyree? What, what, he, he played for the Giants, as Pastor Kate said, but he had the helmet catch. And he won the Super Bowl by a, this amazing catch in the end zone. And uh, David has become a friend of mine, and he... Uh, uh, I just had a four-hour meeting with him this week, and he just, he's, he's amazing. He's leading 12 house churches. No, 13, I'm sorry, 13 house churches. And so, you know, God is doing something great in our region, and uh, he's not coming to talk about football. Uh, he's coming to talk about Jesus. And Amen. marriage. And, it, and marriage. That's right. His wife is awesome. She's wonderful. She, she's, she, you're going you're gonna to love them, and uh, they're going to be ministering. Now, if you just started dating somebody yesterday... This would not be the meeting for you, it, okay? It, don't worry. David will be around again, and, and other people can meet him. But, um, but uh, it's if you're engaged or if, if you are, are currently right, married. Right, so that's okay? May 19th, 630 here. Okay. Okay. Amen? All right, praise God. Let's give to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's get ready. Pastor Kate, can you tell them how they can do that? Sure. The easiest way is through your mobile phone. So you can take a picture of this little QR code on the screen, and it will take you to a series of menus where you can enter your information. You can also give on the app, which is really easy because it stores all of your information, your credit card stuff, if you put it in there. Or you can give the old-fashioned way. You can make checks out to Abundant Grace Christian Church. Or you can give cash. You can ask an usher for an envelope. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for uh, what your children have sowed into the mission. Lord, that you're able to bless what they've given to your hands. Lord, we pray for a multiplication of resources for the multiplication of the message in hearts and minds of men and women. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. So we're going to release the kids now. So if you have a child one years old to 12 years old or sixth grade, uh, we have a program in the back. We ask just that you sign everybody in. Amen. Remember, if you're going to the youth meeting tonight, just go on the website or on the app, click events, and click the button that says get the address uh, because it, it is at Anthony and Sierra's home. Praise God. So, well, you can see um, by today's message title, as it's going to pop up there here in a second, what to do when everything is shaken. <laughs> well, it's one of those messages that I figured, you know, I would just kind of, you know, speak about because, you know, kind of, you know, kind of big thing. More than 200 years, uh, you know, there's an earthquake in New Jersey at a 4.7. Some people said 4.8, then they downgraded to a 4.7. I don't know what the number difference is between that tenth of a point. I just know I was shaking. <laughs> was, anybody, was anybody else? Did you feel that? Yeah, yeah I was on the phone with, with someone, and uh, Beck and I were actually having a staff meeting, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, she, I thought it was a truck at first, and I'm like, my goodness, this is an earthquake right now, you know? And, uh, um, you know, it's shaking people up in more than one way, right? Some people were like, when they first came out, that it was a 4.8. They're like, wait, 4.8 earthquake? Wait, 4.8, April 8th, solar eclipse? Oh my Whoa. <laughs> What's going on? 
Everybody's looking up like the meaning of four, the meaning of eight, the meaning of 48, the meaning of 84. They're looking up the prophetic meaning of, of the Richter scale. Who was Richter? What did he do? You know, all kidding aside, people have, their attention has been. USA Today is talking about Jesus and the potentiality of biblical prophetic signs happening. Um, depending on what you've heard, what you listen to, uh, the solar eclipse, you know, it's not going to be here, right? Right? But there's a band where they're going to have uh, totality, uh, total darkness. And uh, I was on the phone with a minister. Um, he's kind of like one of my professors, actually, mentors in, um, in, in the program I'm in. And uh, he's in Indiana, and he's going to be in the, uh, the strip where there's about four minutes of total darkness. And uh, have you learned, heard the news that people are saying to, you know, stuck up on water? Did you hear that? Yeah. Don't leave your home. And I don't know if that's for our area everywhere or just where all the people are gathering, but they canceled school out there. Wow. You know, a lot of things for four minutes. <laughs> for, for four minutes. Okay, so listen, if we're going to be Christian and we're going to be successful Christians, we need to understand the weightiness of the events that are taking place. And we need to understand the, the importance of remaining solid in the midst of it all. Amen? Have, have you met anybody? I'd just like to see from a show of hands to poll you. Ha, has anybody met people um, that have been a little bit afraid of the events happening? Uh, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not asking if you were afraid. I'm asking, like, you know, the buzz of workers or... Like, they're a little concerned. Like, I don't know, maybe afraid is the too strong a word. But they're a little concerned about the eclipse, is, you know? Like, what's going to happen, right? So, as we look at the scripture, um, we have to kind of consider what should we be concerned about, right? How many people have, have studied some things about the end times? Wow. Wow. <laughs> How many people know when Jesus is coming back? Okay. Like specifically, when is he coming back? Like day and time? Month? Year? We don't know. How many people know he is coming back? Don't put your hands up for this one. How many people are prepared for his coming back? Here's the difference, because a lot of people, their hands would go up, but they're actually unprepared. Yeah. You know, we had a great men's meeting uh, last night, and John, I, I think it's appropriate to share it. Um, uh, John Stanley um, uh, took us through this great activity called Lost at Sea. And uh, we were given a scenario, all the men were given a scenario that uh, you're lost at sea, you're in a raft, you have these supplies, but there's a fire uh, that was in your boat, now you are in a raft, you have oars, you have cigarettes, you have five $1 bills, you have these things, and, and, and then they gave you a supply list of things you could choose between 15 items. The exercise is basically see how well you can do to prioritize which items you would have, and that will determine the likelihood that you will make it through your ordeal. If you choose wisely, the statistical odds of you making it and getting rescued, very high. If you choose unwisely, you're pretty much, you know, you're a goner. You're a goner. And it was amazing because we had to, you know, work through this. And then the Coast Guard, we found out what the Coast Guard, the experts said to do and, and how they rated. And we saw a difference between our rating and the Coast Guard's rating. And if you got like a zero, it meant you, you, you picked exactly what the experts picked. But if you didn't choose wisely, you know, it was like, you know, you're barely going to survive. You know, you're almost dead, but they found you versus, you know, just 
you're, you're gone. And in meditating on this, the end times are a little bit like this. God has given us information, and we've not prioritized it properly. Or we've not known what to do with what he's given to us. And we think we're prepared. And in actuality, we may not be as ready as we think. But the issue that I'm bringing up is not so much about the importance of knowing exactly when, but knowing that you're ready when it happens. See, it's very interesting about what you guys, what you said. There are many people who are afraid of what's happening. You don't know when Jesus is coming back, but there are signs in the heavens and the earth stating that he's coming back, that the end is near, getting nearer and nearer. And we've got this idea of saying, well, okay, but am I prepared? Because I know that he's coming. See, you, you testified you don't know when, but you know that he is. But you know what the danger of that is? That we get lazy, distracted, misunderstood, deceived while we're waiting. The waiting is the period of time between the prophecy and the fulfillment. And many generations thought it was their time that he was going to come back, and he didn't. And there's many generations that don't think that he's going to come back, but he is going to come back like a thief in the night. So what, what Jesus says in the scripture is that he's going to come. People are going to be buying businesses. They're going to be getting married. They're going to be doing all this. They, 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 they had no idea. He's coming when people least expect it. But you know he's coming. How many people know exactly when you're going to leave this earth and be with Jesus. How many people know? Thank God. Because if somebody put their hand up, I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> Seriously. You don't know when, right? But we know the Bible says that there's an appointed day for each of us to leave earth and inherit new bodies. Amen? Okay. Now, how many people know it's coming? Boy, you got really quiet like some of your faces just dropped. You know that your day is coming. You realize that, right? All right so I'm not trying to scare you, but let's, let's just think about this. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but we know he's coming. And we don't know when we're going to, when we're physical bodies are going to die, but we know it's coming. All right, check the scenario out. Whether he comes during our lifetime, Jesus comes back for his second coming during our lifetime, or whether we leave earth before he comes, in either case, we're not here. In either case, the earth is not the way it is now. We know that tremendous shift is happening. And we need to get very serious about understanding the instruction of the Father. The thing that we need to be most concerned about, what's going to happen to you forever, where will you spend forever, is the thing that people are least searching. It's fascinating to me that I'll meet people that are so successful, very wealthy, entrepreneurs, governmental leaders that I've had the opportunity to sit with, meet with, and few of them are thinking about what happened to them when they die. Or the coming of Jesus. There was a time I was sitting with a funeral director. And I was realizing this person is in the business of helping people grieve. But they have no idea what's going to happen to them when, they're, when they leave. This is a very, very common thing. So what does the earthquake and the, the, um, the eclipse, the solar eclipse, what does it do to us? It brings the reality kind of in front of us, doesn't it? When, when things start happening, it brings the reality of things we kind of already knew. But we actually start looking and going, going wait a minute, now? Could it be? There was a uh, story of a meeting. This is a story, not scripture. This is not scripture. This is a story. Did you get that? I don't want anybody to misunderstand. There was a story uh, to, to illustrate something that there was a meeting in hell. And Satan grabbed some demons and said, listen, how could we deceive the earth? And the first demon came forward, and he said, tell them there's no heaven. 
And Satan said, no, that's not going to work. They'll eventually believe in some sort of heaven. Another wicked demon comes and says, tell them there's no hell. Satan says, no, they'll believe there's a hell. A very exceedingly wicked, deceptive demon came and said to Satan, tell them they have time. If we knew Jesus was coming back in 48 hours, what would you do? I know, you'd go try to buy a Corvette. No, you wouldn't. Your priorities would change overnight. You'd do it in a split second. People who know that they've been told that they only have hours to live, days to live, months to live, they, they change their lives. I think that there's an opportunity in the midst of all of the chaos that's happening. And it isn't just an earthquake. You know, it, it isn't. And, and I told the first service, we have to kind of mature our understanding of the events happening on the earth out of just New Jersey, the Northeast, and America. You got to think globally. You got to look at the earthquakes that are happening globally, the major one that just happened in Taiwan. You got to look globally at the economy. You got to look globally at the, I know, fancy terms, geopolitical. But what powers and what kingdoms are in what geographies of the earth? How are they arranged and what are they for and what are they against? What does it mean that there's a World Health Organization? What's their, their agenda? What's their publicized agenda and what's the pattern of the behavior? What is the World Bank, the World Monetary Fund? What are these things? What do they have? I know, we just go to the local bank, we try to get our money, put our money in, but what's ha when you look, start looking globally at the movement of these kinds of things, it, you, you, you start to look at the Bible before the New Jersey earthquake going, man, it's coming. You can look at the lawlessness. You could look at so many things that are happening. The changing of the euro. The things of technology. Things like not being able to buy or sell. The real ID. Mm, yes. You get that name? Yep. The real one? All these things. I'm just putting stuff out because if you look at one isolated thing, maybe you'd go, nah, that's not that big of a deal. But if they are linked together, that shows a pattern, a growing pattern, and a growing movement towards something you begin to go, wow, things are going to be shaken, and they already are. COVID-19 was a type of shaking. That was a type of shaking. Did you see how everything shut down? Everything was able to be shut down very quickly. Oh, it's in moments like these that I want to say things that I probably shouldn't. Because... It's not about an isolated view. It's, again, about a pattern. It is not about a, uh, the fact that there's an earthquake. It's the pattern of the activity on the earth. Is it making sense? All right. Let's open up our Bibles here because let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and, and, and let's take a, a look at this because the premise of this message is to help us understand what to do or how should we be living or what should we do when everything is shaking. Now, I didn't say if everything is shaking, and we may get to Hebrews 12 today to take a look at it, but it's a when. We know that things are going to happen on the earth that have never happened before. We know for sure. I mean, guys, listen, there's more than 2,500 prophecies in the Word of God. Do you know that not one of them has ever been proven wrong? When, when you look, I, and I shared this with you, you look at the statistical accuracy of the Bible, and they don't want to talk about this on the news. They want to talk about Nostradamus, who was wrong. Jesus Christ being risen from the dead is just one of them. What did the resurrected Savior say? What did the one who death could not hold say? And what should our reaction be? All right, here we go. Matthew chapter 24. Let's begin with... Let's begin with verse number three. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, everybody say, when, when? will these things be? And everybody say, what will be the sign, be the sign? of your coming and of the end of the age? 
This is a very, very insightful statement that's made by the disciples. It's starting to give us an idea that they understood some things that are very interesting concerning how they understood them. But now, as he sat in the Mount of Olives, who came to him? Okay, who are the disciples? They're essentially the ones who are following Jesus. Amen? Okay. And he says, they're, they're saying to him privately, tell us. Tell us. What do they want to know from God? Tell us when. Tell us what? When. Now, the Tim LaHaye series, Left Behind, Right? Uh, ideas of the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the, anybody ever hear him called end times? You've heard him called end times? How many people heard him called end times? All right. And he says, when? There can, listen, I, I, I received the question periodically, what do you think about the when? Pastor, are you pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation? For those who don't know, it's prophesied that they're uh, will be seven years of tribulation. Very, 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 very scary. Very, 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 very dark, terrible days. And the big question is, when is the church going to be raptured? Okay? The question is, is it going to be before tribulation, pre-trib, in the middle of it somewhere, mid-trib, or after, post-trib? There's also other things called dispensationalism and hyper-dispensationalism, a millennialist, a hyper-millennialist. There's so many now, um, like, uh, all those things are divisions or like, uh, you know, if you like to have one pizza pie and they keep slicing it up with little differences, that's what all these things are. And what are they trying to figure out? When? So a lot of people are very interested to find out When? But I, I want to let you know that Jesus, he hears this, and in verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, what does he say? Take that no one, take heed that no one, be careful, take notice that no one deceives you. So the disciples are asking when. And Jesus does not answer them. The concern of God is not the same as the concern of man. The human beings want to know when, and Jesus, his shift is different. His focus is different. He says, be careful, take heed, that no one deceives you. While, while people want to know when, God is concerned about whether you are or whether we are or not deceived. So what he's concerned about is the condition of the disciples when he comes. That's a difference, isn't it? And what's his concern? Deception. I know this is deep stuff, but Jesus doesn't know the time or the hour when he himself is coming. Yeah. Only the Father in heaven knows. So what's interesting is they're asking Jesus who the Father has reserved that knowledge and he doesn't know. So you're talking to the master teacher who is God, who knows all things, but the Father only knows when the time or day is. So this is a picture of our Adonai, mm. translated from Hebrew, Master Lord, who is not concerned about the when. Ooh, he's the one coming back, and he's not concerned about the when. When Jesus comes back, I preached on Palm Sunday along with multitudes of leaders and ministers and Christians that Jesus came on a donkey, an animal of peace. But when he comes back, he's no longer on an animal of peace. He's on an animal of war, a horse. He, he listen, listen, 
He has an iron scepter by which he will rule the nations. And he's not coming to save. He's coming to judge. The second coming is very different from the first coming. And I am going to be teaching at some point about the Jesus in the second coming because he isn't a different Jesus, but it is a different work contained in the gospel about when he comes. But he is the one who is the one who is going to be coming with multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes, and he is going to be rendering justice. He's going to be judging the world for its evil. Don't think that God's judgment is no longer on evil. I preached a few days ago, a Good Friday, I think it was then, that the cup of wrath is empty. That's for those who have received forgiveness. In other words, there's no wrath upon the children of God because Jesus drank the cup of wrath. That does not mean that there is not a wrath unspeakable reserved to judge the rest of the world. In the story of the Exodus, when, in, in the Passover, the, 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 the nation of Israel were to put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. You know, it's, it's, it's the sides and, and the top of the door. And those who applied the blood, the angel of death would not come, would not be able to enter, and the people were safe. If you did not have the blood, you would die. The firstborn would have died. The Bible didn't say that because the lamb's blood was there that everyone was okay. The same thing in the judgment of the second coming. So this is why when, when the signs of the times and things begin happening more and more and more, and most of them we're not even seeing. Most of them we're so concerned about our, you know, our little world, we're not even seeing those signs. The magi who saw the star in the sky were considering the heavenly signs, weren't they? In the natural heavens. They were taking time. Three, 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 only three. And they prepared gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All prophetic pointings to the uh, identity, suffering, and death of Jesus Christ. Three, because they followed the signs. Most of us are not following any signs. And most of the signs have been twisted in people's minds for astrology yes. rather than understanding that every star is named by God. Yeah, come on. Come on. So there's a lot of people who will follow astrology rather than astronomy. Amen. Because astronomy is still pointing to the prophetic signs of God, but astrology is not. Astrology is witchcraft. Right. Don't do that. Don't read your horror scope. Right. Horror scope. <laughs> Some people got that. Don't do that. What's going to happen to me this month? Don't do that. That's not right. That's evil. There's judgment on that. Don't link yourself with that. Amen? Amen. If you want to find out what's going to happen to you, read the Word of God. Hallelujah. Only two things are going to happen to you, good or bad. Hallelujah. Either, either life or death, yeah, right. <laughs> heaven or hell, blessed or cursed. Right. By the way, how are you today? Blessed. I see, you know what's going on. <laughs> you read the good word of God, you, get, you read God's mind. So let's go back to Matthew 24. So they ask him the question, when? But I want to highlight something. They asked when for two events. Two. One is when are you coming? And what's the second one? The end of the age. Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. The identity of Jesus is what's on Jesus' mind. The deception is central to who is he? There will be many false Christs. They will be preaching Christ, but it will not be him. They will use his name. People will think, yes, I believe in Jesus. It's the wrong one. It's a false Christ. 
False prophets are on the earth. Already there have been people claiming to be Jesus on the earth already. Jesus is a good shepherd. And I believe in times like these, we need to be aware and look at the signs, but we need to be aware to look at the content of his shepherding because the content of the shepherding of the Savior takes us away from the sensationalism of the end times in the church. It brings us to being rooted and it brings us to focus on the right things. What do you think is going to happen if we focus on the wrong things? Why do you think the devil wants us to focus on the wrong things? Because he wants us to be unprepared and not fulfill what God has called us to fulfill. Now listen, even people who don't go to church, don't believe in Jesus, they're kind of going, wow, you know, this, a lot of stuff's happening of biblical proportions. And they get afraid. I want to tell you that we should not be afraid. Verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Listen to verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. You will hear of wars and what? Rumors of wars. See that you are not. Oh, thank, somebody say thank you, Jesus. Who is he talking to? Disciples. Now, people who don't know Jesus, they should be troubled. The Bible declares that they should be troubled, especially in Revelation. Hebrews. Chapter 12, hopefully we'll get there today. But it says that you should not be what? Troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. All right. What, what do we do with some of the things? Has anybody, and, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's okay if you have, but... Has anybody been watching any YouTube videos about the solar eclipse or about the prophetic nature of those things? Anybody? Okay. It's pretty popular. Some people have uh, sent them to me. Uh, I have not watched them. So I just want to let you know that I didn't watch them because I knew um, that I didn't want my mind to be a little bit mixed up between what was in Scripture and what maybe was being prophesied. And so what I'm saying to you is separate from something you may have sent me because I didn't see it. Okay, you, you got that? Okay. So there are some really deep things that are being described. You know, for example, one that's really common is the, the eclipse in 2017 looked like a band coming through the United States. Now the eclipse of 2024 is another band coming through exactly the, the opposite direction, making an X. Then they looked at the band where there's going to be darkness, and they found that there are cities of Nineveh there. And the first time that in 2017, they were cities of Salem, which means peace. And so they're beginning to piece things together between, okay, is this a sign of God telling us to repent? All right. I just, in the very beginning of Jesus' ministry after he was baptized, you know what he said? He repent. <laughs> so some people are like, whoa, should we repent? This is why I want to bring this to you. Some people, when you're looking at the specifics of how to interpret the signs, how to interpret the, the eclipse, um, we, were, we were discussing about the cicada. Um, that is coming in when? This summer. this summer. Has anybody ever heard about the cicadas? Uh, it is a, um, we can't even imagine how many cicadas are going to be. Usually, most of them are in the southern belt, okay? But there's going to be, literally, they predict billions of cicadas emerging. There's two species that are coming up at the same time and they're molting and their mating season happens happening at the same time. And uh, this is something that is apparently of huge proportions. And uh, people are causing, it's causing them to think about, you know, a type of locust type of thing. What are they going to do? So you've got these like, it hasn't, you know, had an earthquake in more than 200 years and and then you, you've got the solar eclipse, and they say there's some very unique things about this solar eclipse. And then you're looking and saying, okay, look at these prophetic signs, and then the cicadas and things like this. And what, 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 what I want to share with you is uh, we can get a little crazy um, going after the, some of the specifics, gra the granular specifics. 
And I was helping the first service to understand that I want to hear Jesus and I want to make sure that I'm following what he's saying. And he wasn't telling me to be concerned about the timing. He was telling me not to be deceived. So my focus, therefore, is I don't want to be deceived. So I have to be very careful about what I listen to and how much weight it holds in my life. Because if Jesus, listen, let, 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 let's, let's go a little bit further, and, 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 and you're going to see. It says uh, in, in verse number 7, for, so these things must come to pass. This is not something you can pray that not happen. You, you, you can't go to God, God okay, you know, uh, could, could we skip the whole time, age of sorrows and tribulation? No. It, it's part of the message of the gospel. It says here, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Did he go into a lot of detail? I mean, it's not like there isn't detail, but the detail is still fairly at a high level, isn't it? Now, this isn't all that he says, because in other books, in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Ezekiel, and in many different places, uh, in Psalms, in, in different places, we're seeing prophetic, the whole scripture is prophetic, pointing toward things. So, you know, the age of desolation, and, and, and you look at Daniel, and you're like, okay, now I understand what that means. So the Bible is furnishing a lot of detail, but I'm, what I'm going to say is it's not necessarily the detail that YouTube is always giving. And if you don't know the detail in the scripture, how do you discern the detail on YouTube? Is it making sense? Now, I'm not rejecting that God would speak to prophets and well-studied men and women that are bringing revelation to the earth. I'm saying you must be careful. You must be very careful. Because if you've only read the Bible five times in your life, if you've only read the Bible ten times in your life, you still are at the beginning. Yes. And most people haven't even read the Bible once. So people are like, wow, it's going through all these cities of Nineveh. And most people are like, what's Nineveh? <laughs> what's its connection to Don Jonah? What's its connection to Jesus being, uh, Jonah being in the belly of the whale and Jesus being in the belly of the earth? If you don't understand the significance of what's revealed by Scripture, you can't stand in things that are extra biblical. You won't know if they're connected or not. So I told the, the first church that you got to build a parking lot. Yeah, big one too. When I hear something that I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but I don't want to reject it because, my goodness, the Holy Spirit may be sharing something. I park it. I park it. And then I, I, I know I'm not ready to receive that. And I have no problem sharing this with you. I am unqualified to judge certain prophecies that are being spoken. I'm unqualified. Why? Because in order to understand whether that particular prophecy is accurate, connected to those things which are connected to those things, i got to understand this long list of stuff before I can actually determine whether that is sound or not. People are like, well, that means that you can't judge many things. Exactly. Well, how are you going to live your life? How are you going to know what's happening? Oh, there is a place I can go that I don't have to park anything. The Word of God. Hallelujah. I can receive what the Word of God says. And listen, this is what I believe with my whole heart. I believe that God is looking for people who will listen to His Word before the signs. If you chase the signs and you don't know the Word, take heed if you be deceived. But if you follow His Word you'll be able to interpret the signs. 
you would have taken heed. You take heed because you listen to his word. I don't think that we should have a heart posture that says, now not only do I know that uh, th th there's some cities called Nineveh, which very well may have tremendous prophetic meaning that God is telling America again, repent, repent, repent. But you see, if somebody comes to a conclusion that says we need to repent, I'm like, yeah, got it. That's good. But what happens if the thing that you hear convinces you and the second thing is linked to the thing you don't know and the third thing is linked to the thing that you don't know which was linked to the thing that you weren't sure of and 10 things down later after 10 years, you're now thinking some weird stuff. And you're like, no, this is biblical. And has this happened many times? It has happened many times. It has happened to ministers. It has happened to ministries that have gotten out of balance. I think this is pretty powerful. What happens when a childlike heart says, if I see pestilences, which are sicknesses, and famines, and earthquakes, and wars, and rumors of wars, these are not physical things. These are the beginning of sorrows. Oh my goodness, this means the end of the age is already on its way. And to need more detail than that can get you in trouble. That can get you in a lot of trouble. Why? You didn't listen to the words of Jesus. I didn't, convince me more. Convince me more. So here's the deal. Do people get saved because of signs? Not really. No. No. Mm -mm. Do people get saved because of miracles and healings? Not directly. Here's actually what's happening. The signs point to Jesus. The healing points to Jesus. The miracle points to Jesus. If you are left with a sign, all you are are impressed, made afraid, moved, questioning, or maybe inspired, but you're still not saved. Because if the sign doesn't lead you to the Savior, then you didn't benefit from what the sign's purpose was. Is this making sense? Yes. So we're saved by the signs making us awake. But the awakening is for those who don't know Jesus. The signs are actually not for the saved in the way we would think. The signs are educating us. They're pointing us. They're, they're telling us the times and seasons. They're, they're guiding us to God's accuracy of the prophetic word. But guess what? If you're in Jesus, you don't need the sign to stay in Jesus. You're already in him. That's why Jesus tells the disciples, don't be afraid. Is this making sense? So what should happen is the signs for the believers should go, yep, we know that. We're not surprised of that. But you have a whole lot of Christians going, do you think the Bible is true? <laughs> Did you feel that in New Jersey? <laughs> That's actually showing you didn't deeply receive Amen. the simple, clear words of the Savior. Is this making sense, church? So I would recommend that you would park certain things so that you are not misled or deceived by certain things because Satan is very cunning and he wants us to, get to, fo he wants us to follow signs instead of Jesus' words. So the parking lot, and I, and I was making a joke about this, but has anybody ever lost their car? Like you parked it and you don't know where you parked it, but you know it's somewhere. And then in, in reaction to that, you take out your key fob. Anybody? Yeah, you know, right? And so you take it out, and what do you do? You, you, you like hit it, right? And then you go like this, and you go like this, and then, and then people go like this. And then you hear, whoo, whoo. And you're like, ah, oh, my car. Well, when I park certain things that I know I'm not ready to judge whether they're right or wrong, and then I continue to study the Word of God, then you know what God does? Holy Spirit takes out the Holy Spirit key fob kind of thing. And then there was a thing that happened three years ago that I was thinking about that I didn't know. But now because of study and now because of maturity and now because of prayer and now the Spirit says Steve's ready for that. All of a sudden in the Spirit, it's an analogy. Woo, woo. 
oh, let me go check out that thing that was parked. And you go, whoa. But the danger is that even when things are prophetically accurate, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to interpret it. We don't know how to apply it. So I'd rather us be like simple children. Simple children. Childlike. This says, Lord, you told us when we see these things. So if somebody was to say to me, Are, was the New Jersey earthquake part of the end? I say, yeah. As well as the one in Taiwan. As well as the hundreds of other ones that are happening. It's part of the birth pangs. Why? The Bible says it. Now, if somebody says, does it mean that, that this is the big one? I said, you keep studying. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Let's go a little bit further, Matthew chapter 24. Because, listen, I am not saying that God is not using prophets. I am not saying that he is not giving revelation. I'm merely saying we need to be humble, and we need to be careful, and we need to be studyful to be able to handle what God is speaking, or maybe it isn't necessarily an accurate understanding. Has anybody found out that there's really blessed people, scholars, intense in the Holy Spirit, and you've heard these prophecies, but then you go to other people who you know are beautiful servants of God, intense and also well-studied, and they're not agreeing? Now it's like, oh, I believe this prophet, and the next one says, I believe this prophet. You're al we're already messed up. We should take a step back and say, you guys continue working out. I'm going to study along with you until we figure out what God's saying. And concerning the time, it was not. Amen? It was not the focus. What did he tell the disciples? Don't be troubled. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up, and, and there it is again, deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will what? What, what abounds? So now we have the hatred against Christianity. Are, are, are you grabbing it? He's, he's saying what's going to happen. So look at, look, look, do anybody listen to the news? Is Christianity popular today? It's not, not, not so much, right? It's bringing a lot of division and a lot of things. And uh, th these things are already in process. The sorrows are already in process. And it says that the love of many is going to what? Grow cold. See, what's amazing about this is Jesus is, again, addressing the condition of the believer when he comes. All of these things are pointing to being prepared, being ready, being and in a place that God is saying to be. So he's saying lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But look at verse 13. I want you to read this out loud. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So look, look, look at this. You know what I'm seeing? God is saying here that endurance for the believer, endurance for the church is the key. Don't be deceived. Know that this is happening, and you need to endure. And at the forefront of all that, be encouraged. Don't be afraid. Amen. Why? Because the church is victorious. Why? Because the church is in covenant. Why? Because the church is not just thinking about when he's coming back. We're thinking about something else. At least we're supposed to, and I'll share that in a moment. But the Bible is describing here that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, all the nations, and then the end will come. So what should the focus be here? What do we do when everything shakes? What do we do when everything is shaken? Money, governments, politics, the earth itself. I mean, I, I never felt an earthquake before. Is that anybody's first time of feeling an earthquake? Yeah, I never felt that before. I was really meditating on it, like what? power does it take to move the earth? Right? What kind of strength does it take to move the very ground for miles and miles and miles? And that was not even a strong one. Is it biblical that things in the spirit would have power to move the earth? 100%. Is it biblical to say that, that things in the spirit realm actually have the power to shake the very earth? 
The answer is yes. Let's put up uh, Psalms, please. 77 verse 18. It says, the voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Now, I know scientists would love to say, well, it's because this Atlantic shelf is colliding with this Atlantic shelf, and this is happening. All right, listen. Yeah, I, I get it, but that's not the why. That's the what happened. That's not what moved the Atlantic shelf. Are, are, are you understanding that? Acts 4.31, it says... The, the place when they prayed, it says the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. The place was what? Shaken. Matthew 27. This one, we just, we just heard this one in being around. What does the Bible say? It says, when the centurion and those with him, verse 54 of Matthew 27. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake. What happened when Jesus Christ died? The earth quaked. The earth shook. So all of these things have different reasons why the earth shook. You, are, are you with me, guys? Yeah. And, and what's amazing is um, when you look at the reality Paul and Silas in Acts 16, they were praying and singing hymns. And the foundation of the prison shook. Oh, man, God moves earth, man. Come on. And our prayers move earth. So it is absolutely biblical. So don't think that, oh, well, you know, I don't know if that's spiritual. It's spiritual. But what a bigger thing is, is to look at the patterns of what's happening, putting them together. And you know what you get? You know what's happening to the earth? The Bible says that it's birth pangs. Birth pangs. How many mamas do we have here? You've, you've experienced birth. Come on, put them high, put them high. Okay. So you guys understand birth pangs. Was it pleasant? How many moms would say, let me have another? Some of you are like, another birth pang? I think not. But yet, you still often want to have more children. Wow. That's very interesting. The church has to learn from moms. You see, there's no birth without the birth pangs. And these earthquakes and rumors of wars, pestilences and famines... I mean, it's in the news now that the U.S. is very concerned about a food shortage. It's like COVID, and people are concerned about what the next pandemic is. There's already announcements in some places that they think of what it's going to be. Isn't that crazy in and of itself? We know what's coming next. How does that work? That's another sermon. But the idea is that you've got famine, pestilences, and we've got wars. We've got wars going on now that are set, they're all over the world. Has anybody looked at the news? Everybody is, fi is fighting and preparing to fight everybody else. Did you know this? Do you know that Japan, the building of the Japanese military now, is at an all-time high? The entire Pacific region in RIM and Australia and the U.S. are doing war games. They just had a mess. The largest practice of war, war games, ever put together. Not in the news too much. Do you think it's a coincidence that these very things that are in the news are the very three things that, that God says in Matthew chapter 24? Come on. They're not different. They're the same things. So, what do we do? Well, what did he say? Don't be troubled. Don't be deceived, but don't be troubled. Now, what did they ask? I'm going to go back to this, and we're going to be ending up soon. But they asked a question can you put up 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 3 again? Put up 24, verse 3. 
chapter 24, verse 3. And I want you to read this with me again. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your what? Your coming and of what? Okay. All right. This very, very interesting phrase, the end of the age. Jesus Christ in, his, in the great commission he gave, can you put up uh, the King James Version if you can find that? The King James Version of Matthew 28, 18. He says, behold, all power and authority have been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore into all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So as he's going through this now, now you guys going to be able to get it? Guys, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. He says in chapter 28, verse 18, just get it up there, media team, when you can. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying what? You can use the new King James if it's faster. It's, it's, it's fine. But all what? Has been given to me and where? All right. Go, therefore, and make what? Disciples of all the? Baptizing them in the name of the? And of the? And of the? Teaching them to? all things that I have commanded you, including do not be deceived. Take heed, do not be deceived. Amen? Amen. Okay? And what? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What is the end of the age? All right, we're going to put a bit of a shift here, and uh, I'm not going to teach through all this, but this is one of the greatest things that I think we can move from doomsday mentality into an enduring mentality because the Bible says in Matthew 24, he who endures to the end shall be Endurance means you don't give up. Endurance means no matter what happens, you don't relinquish your faith. Endurance means you finish what you began. Endurance means you never got deceived and you stayed persisted in the path. Endurance means you never went to the way and broad way that leads to destruction. You remained in the narrow way that leads to life that few people find. Endurance means steadfastness. Endurance means strength of faith. Endurance means patience. Endurance means I'm not leaving my post. Endurance means I'm staying with you, Jesus. Endurance means I'm going to think what you told me to think. Amen. And when you, listen, Jesus endured the cross by looking at the joy that was beset him. He endured the cross because of the joy of you and me being saved. The woman endures the pains of birth because she knows the baby's coming. Do you focus on the birth pangs or do you focus on the baby? Which one? The baby. But why does the church focus on the birth pangs? The birth pangs and the earth is giving birth to something glorious and we're talking about the end times. You ever hear the end times? That's like saying the end of the age in a way but just focused on the end. We got to look at the Bible. We got to read the Bible. And we have to realize something. The Bible is not focused on the end. It's focused on that which the end is ushering in. Now, I know that there's a whole lot of people who, who have learned, you know, just try to stay saved, you know. That's just a mentality. It's like, you know, let me just, let me just try to, you know, keep going to church until God, like, just, you know, plucks me out. And I can become a little floating cloud on top of clouds. It's not what the Bible is saying. The focus of the story of the Bible is not actually on destruction. It's focused on restoration. Amen. The end of the age is not the destruction of all things. It's the end of the age. Let's just go real quickly to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to do this very, very quickly. Hebrews chapter 12. There's so much in the scripture about these topics. But I want you to see um, in verse number 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. This is talking about God. 
Jesus. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. This is speaking about the book of Haggai in chapter 2, verse 6. And God was not speaking about the utter destruction of the city. He was talking about the overwhelming of the evil in the city so that God's kingdom can reign. God is explaining here not the destruction of something, but the end of something that destruction brings part of, but the utterance in of a new creation. The focus of the Bible story doesn't end with the end. We as Christians can start to change our focus upon the scary of this while, number one, building faith, building a Christian life that endures, that we're training to endure. If you are in a popularity contest and you are wanting to be liked in your life, you're in big risk. Because by being a Christian, you're going to be unliked. Right now on the earth, there are people who are saying, okay, I I believe Jesus. Oh, but I'm going to lose my mom. I'm going to lose my dad. I'm going to lose. He said, you must love me more than father, mother, wife, children, yea, even your own life. Otherwise, you're not worthy to be my disciple. But what did he say for those who do? Those who have left mothers and fathers receive households and mothers and fathers a hundredfold here and later. You see, the focus isn't on what you lose. The focus is on what you gain. The Bible says come to the cross and what? Die. Let your old nature die. Put to death your old nature, your old sinful nature. So why? So you can have resurrection life. What do you think is happening in creation? If we're supposed to be made new, what's going to happen to creation? It's going to be made new. Wow. God is going to wipe out all evil. He is going to judge. There are going to be horrible, horrendous things. But God is saying to the church, endure whatever comes, whenever it comes, however it comes, because those who endure are going to receive the joy of the new creation like a mother receives the joy of a new life. So my shift doesn't have to be afraid. Let's turn to John 16, verse 33. Let's go there to see what Jesus is saying. Almost finished. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, even verse 31, let's go there. Jesus answered them, do, uh, do, you, now, uh, do you now believe Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have what? You may have what? You may have what? Come on. In the world you will have what? But be of what? Good cheer. I have overcome the world. Church, I don't know exactly what, when, how, down to the nth degree of some of these things. But I know that my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, is speaking to me and to his church, that his concern is that we would remain steadfast in him, that we would read, obey, fellowship, live the life that God has called us to live so that we may grow a faith that is able to endure no matter what is ahead of us. Amen? We are called to be able to stand and to stand strong. And I know that it could be unnerving to say, are these things in our generation? Are these things going to happen? What's going to happen to my life? The best I can tell you is be inside of Jesus. That is the best place to be, the most secure place to be, and then you don't have to fear. Number two, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of heaven. And then everything else will be added. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 1, to look upward, to look at the things in the heavenly, not in the things in the earth. This should shift us to understand, Lord, let us be found faithful while we wait for your return. And honestly, a real believer 
who's mature in the faith isn't afraid of the thought of his return. They're actually crazy excited. Could it be? Is our king coming? Could it be? Is it now? This is wonderful. Yeah, I know the tribulation. Yeah, I know the sorrow, but the king's coming. Wait, but that means this is coming. Yeah, I know it's going to be absolutely blah, 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 blah. But anyway, no problem because what's coming is that good. What's coming is that glorious. What, what's coming is that wonderful. Amen? So each time that I see videos, each time that I see uh, these, these kind of world events, I kind of, my, my, my head goes, Lord, I pray I'll be ready. Amen? Maybe it'll be good if we could become that childlike that we listen to the king and we prepare for his coming. Now, if you don't know Jesus, there is no new creation. There's only destruction. So these pains and these birth pangs and these signs, they're actually part of the grace of God. Because what they do is they awaken people to realize the Bible is not that irrelevant, hard to understand book of fairy tales that they were told. They start saying, oh my goodness, this is real. So ask me how much time we have left. I don't know. But I know we have less than yesterday. And I know that for those who don't hear his signs, it's going to come like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's coming. It could be tonight. But many people reading the prophecies would say, not yet. I just want to be ready. So I want you to make sure that you are seeking Jesus and that you are fellowshipping with one another and that we, no matter what, would be ready. Because I'm going to tell you, the more you're in Jesus, the less you fear. I'm, I'm telling you. I, I, I can experience it myself. But what, what I think I'm going to end this message with is, is something that I was sharing with the early church. If, if we're afraid of the judgment, the way the unbelievers are afraid of the judgment... And like we're inviting them to come to house church meetings and be like, you got to experience this. We're so afraid too. But we get to be afraid with food. Why don't we be afraid together? Why don't you come and we'll sing songs and be afraid together? This is not the witness of the world. I mean the witness of Jesus Christ in the world. They should say, why aren't you afraid? Why do you have peace? Because I have Jesus. He told me to be at peace. Why are you so afraid when you're seeing what China is doing right now? And that, that Xi Jinping actually declares the timing that he's going to invade Taiwan. And that Taiwan has all the computer chips and all the processors. And what that's going to mean globally to our infrastructure that we relied upon so deeply. Why aren't you worried about that? Well, because he said that I shouldn't be troubled. Can I tell you something? Evil is not the one that gets the glory for shaking the earth. God is shaking the heavens and the earth. And I want to show you one thing before we leave. I'll use this. Oh, this is... <clears throat> no, actually, it's very light. <laughs> Just messing with you. We, we, we didn't get the Hebrews too much, but we have to... <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I want you to watch it. Jesus is shaking the heavens and the earth, right? Okay, watch this. Okay. Am I shaking? I want you to imagine this is the world. This is the economy. This is the medical system, the healthcare system. This is everything. Look, it's shaking. All right, I don't want to shake it all, all over the place. but I'm not shaking. Jesus isn't shaking. Jesus is doing the shaking. Guess where his church is? Church is his body. The church is in shaking. If the church is in Christ, 
the church is like, oh, baby, those are the signs. People get ready. Come on, repent. The time is near. Come on, repent. Right? That's the message. Come on, let's get right with God. And the current believers are like, Maranatha. You know what that means? The Lord cometh. Like, come on, Jesus. This is going to be awesome. Come on, guys. Get in the ship. Get in the boat. Don't you see the signs? you got to wake up, world. But the church is saying, yeah. Who's actually very afraid? Those who have not received. <laughs> Where's Juliet? Well, yeah, I need your help after with that. You can take care of that. The world who has not received him. That's where the terror is. So I pray, that, I pray that this message this morning, its purpose has been to shepherd you into the voice of the shepherd. It's to protect you while to inspire you. It's to prepare you to grow to become a church that endures. Jesus is coming back for fully devoted disciples who neither flinch or shy back in the face of persecution and we are called to stand. Amen? And to be glorious. You want to know something amazing? It's going to get worse and worse, but it's going to get better and better at the same time. The evil is going to get more evil and the righteousness is going to become that much more aware and people are going to be able to see the true church emerge and the counterfeits will be revealed and then people are going to say, I see, Lord, this is a people. The true church, the true believers of Jesus are all over the earth today. Our church needs to be connected with them. So instead of preparing you for the best of times, Jesus is preparing us to be the best in some of the worst of times. Did you get that? And his glory will be shown. And whether he comes back in this age or our children, we would have fulfilled our purpose. So what do we need to do? We need to be busy about the Father's business on the earth until he comes, which means we need to disciple and get discipled and to disciple others. It means I, mean, I need to be devoted and I need to make devoted disciples. It means we need to multiply house churches and do the work of the Great Commission until he comes. These are the people that God is pleased with so that we may become a pure and spotless bride because Jesus isn't coming back for something messed up. He's coming back for a pure and spotless bride called the church. Amen? Hallelujah. Don't be afraid. Let's be found faithful. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm